Human-caused climate change is a lie. Greta Thunberg is a groomed tool of the establishment. She is the part of the Hegelian dialectic where a false solution, which plays into the hands of her controllers, is suggested. I love the Internet's talk radio station called Truth Frequency Radio, TFR. My favorite show on it is Your DIY Health. A while ago, I downloaded a lot of episodes of that from the archives, and I listened to them. The thesis of the show is that if you avoid the foods which Dr. Wallach says to avoid, and if you take Dr. Wallach's nutritional supplements, you'll live a long and healthy life. Yeah, I know it sounds like I'm talking about an infomercial, but it's my favorite TFR show because I've spent time researching the nutrients that are in those supplements, and I concur with what the host, Jim Ram, is saying. Mr. Ram also recommends some other supplements that he has researched. My second favorite show on TFR is Ironworks. The hosts are flat earthers who laugh at silly space news. In March of 2015, I converted to being a flat earther, so I'm in that show's target demographic, and that's why it appeals to me a lot. My third favorite show on TFR is a two-way tie between Quantum Connections, a.k.a. Truth Frequency News, and The Covert Report with Susan Lindauer. The host of Quantum Connections, Lucky, usually has author Brooks Agnew with her, and they go over interesting news stories. Lucky and Brooks are very opinionated, but the more you research, the more you realize that they're probably correct. And on the covert report, Susan Lindauer often covers very important topics, sometimes having whistleblowers on. My fourth favorite show on TFR is a two-way tie between X Squared Radio and the Christopher Everard Show. On X Squared Radio, author Brooks Agnew hosts it, and he goes over news stories that, in the radio world, one tends to hear about first on his show, and then later, within the next week, on other shows. My favorite part of his show is the Religion of Peace Report, which is where he briefly covers the week's turbulences in the mu Muslim world. Every week, Muslims attack innocent people in multiple countries. It's important to stay informed of that. On the Christopher Everard show, Mr. Everard is an amazingly well-researched guy who covers a lot of esoteric and otherwise interesting topics. My fifth favorite show on TFR is a two-way tie between The Infinite Fringe and The Paranormal Portal. The Infinite Fringe is hosted by Billy Ray Valentine. Mr. Valentine occasionally has some amazing guests on and some amazing topics are covered. The Paranormal Portal covers all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff. My sixth favorite show on TFR is a tie between Awakening Liberty and Stanching Tyranny. On Awakening Liberty, Sean Caron talks about important issues of the day. On Stanching Tyranny, the Stanch brothers take some time to get used to, but once you learn where they stand on issues and why, one realizes they have a lot of heart. My seventh favorite show on TFR is a three-way tie between The Kev Baker Show, The Freedom Link with Joe Joseph, and Freaky Friday with The Woo Crew. On The Kev Baker Show, even though Kev covers some conspiracies, his show is actually the closest thing TFR has to a mainstream-type program, and he probably wouldn't like to hear someone say that. It's probably the one show on TFR that would be the easiest to get the average person addicted to. The Freedom Link and Freaky Friday are both quite similar to the Kev Baker show in a lot of ways. My eighth favorite show on TFR is a three-way tie between Jaronism Monday Night Raw and Strange World and Revolutionary Radio. The hosts are Flat Earthers. Even though I'm a Flat Earther, these shows are low on my personal list because... Once one knows it's flat, one doesn't have to be hit over the head with it all the time. There are some other great shows on TFR that I haven't mentioned, some hidden gems that take some time to get used to, some acclimation. Please go to tfrlive.com and check out all the shows for yourself. When I was a little kid, 
I looked out my bedroom window and I saw a green guy run across my backyard. The green guy was wearing some kind of machine on his back which looked similar to the packs which were worn on the backs of the guys on the Ghostbusters films. He was green, bright green, and he was a fast runner. I only saw him once and I'm sure it wasn't a dream. Also, when I was a kid, I saw a UFO during my walk to school one morning. It was a line of light in the sky which was making a high-pitched noise. It looked similar to what some episodes of Doctor Who showed as a crack in space and time. When I got to school, I told my classmates and they didn't believe me and they laughed about it. But uh, later on, I saw... Like, I used to read all the books in the school library about UFOs, and I, like, there were actually books about UFOs in the school library, and I used to read all of them, and shortly after I told my classmates about that one that I saw, I saw the exact same type of UFO being described in a book and it uh, gave an explanation for it, uh, some kind of natural phenomenon of light hitting water and shining up onto the clouds, but uh, that explanation really doesn't seem to fit with the precise way that the particular thing looked. So I really think that that explanation is BS, which is meant to cover up some sort of deeper truth. When I was 12 years old, I slept in the same bedroom as my 11-year-old sister and my 13-year-old brother. One very early morning, I woke up and saw an angel standing beside my sister's bed looking at my sister. By angel, I mean a winged woman wearing long garments. The angel turned her head to look at me, and her eyeballs were blank like a bl blind person's eyes. Although I don't think angels should be a source of fear when that angel was looking at me, I was the most afraid that I have ever been in my life. I have never been more afraid. One summer afternoon, while I was a young adult, my family celebrated a birthday party at a beach called Cranberry Flats. One of my sisters noticed a flying saucer in the sky, and she pointed it out to me since she knew I was interested in that sort of thing. I looked at it as it just hung there in the sky, barely moving. My sister lost interest, and she returned to making sculptures out of sand, even though there was still a UFO in the sky which she knew about, yet she was more interested in making a sand sculpture. So I looked at the saucer for a couple of minutes until it suddenly warped away in an instant flash of speed. Then I told my sister that it was quite a spectacle when it warped away, and I asked her why she didn't watch it until it did that. And she said something about how she knows UFOs exist, but she in isn't as interested in them as I am. One of the cats I had was named Char, and I taught him how to wear a leash and take walks with me. So one night while one of my brothers and I were walking with Char in a field that was near the house where we used to live, my brother pointed at an orange circle in the sky that was zooming across the sky in an impossible zigzag pattern. It just kept turning at impossible angles, impossible speeds, impossible for an aircraft to do. Seeing that UFO was our reward for teaching a cat to take walks with us, I guess. On December 9th, 2017, shortly after 6.30 a.m., I was wide awake and I was walking to the nearby corner store to buy a pack of cigarettes when I saw an apparition of a face that was double the size of a human head, and it had that circular-mouthed expression of the famous painting, The Scream. In some ways, the face was kind of snake-like. The face just stayed still above a front yard. It was looking at me, and I wasn't scared at all. In fact, I said to it that it was cool. I just kept walking on my way, and it didn't follow me. Later, I told an aboriginal grandmother about that face, and she said that it might be called a Wendigo. Tell me, Chrissy, do 
would it take the wind out of your Nina Pinta and Santa Maria to know that Leaf Erickson beat you in discovering America? <laughs> and Leaf, couldn't you just kick yourself for not cashing in on it like Chris did? Yup, and him and he. Maybe I should kick him. Pasta Pazula, the world, she's left. If you want to learn the details of Flat Earth, search for a group on YouTube that call themselves Globe Busters. After thinking about it for a while, the strongest argument I had against Flat Earth recently crumbled. My argument had to do with a thing I once heard of called Continental Shelves. Long story short, the particular angles I approached that argument with ended up crushing the particular argument, so I still think the Earth is flat. I believed in a globe and all the cosmology that came with it for 33 years. The Earth has been characterized by some flat earthers as the very foundation of reality, but I think that's wrong. Even though I'm a flat earther, I still believe that there's way more out there to explore. There was a group on the, on the internet a while ago called the In Infinite Plane Society, and I'm leaning towards a cosmology not too much unlike the one their members have in common. I think it's obvious to any flat earther that the truest maps ever made of what is known to humans aren't shared with the general public. The current mainstream e education estimated circumference of the globe does not vibe with observations that are shared by flat earthers often within the alt-alternative media of the flat earthers. And although the case is solid, there are many people who will never hear that argument because they don't even think of tuning in to the alt-alternative media of the Flat Earthers. In the Flat Earth models, the moon and sun are a lot closer and a lot smaller than what we've been taught in schools. According to Flat Earthers, pretty much every aspect of the government-run space agencies are baloney. According to a conspiracy theory that many more people buy than you may think, we are taught an inaccurate picture of pretty much every aspect of higher altitude. My flat earth understanding calls into question my previous mainstream science belief that we are all made of star stuff. The education system is a batch conversion into the heliocentric cult. I bet that when exploration expeditions the details of which are classified found the edge of the dome which many flat earthers believe exists. Their own limited perspective mistook it for a mountain that is as high up as the moon. How can one who likes writing not be a flat earther when the speculations that occur from within the world view are so poetic? One doesn't even bother with looking into alternative geographical concepts such as hollow earth or flat earth until they have studied some maps. So maybe, if any part of these videos are to be included in any part of the education of any younger persons who are in any part of the world, which is a risk faced by every content creator, I should proceed with only content that is socially responsible, such as teaching viewers to be kind to each other, such as to respond to hatred with love. As a flat earther, I would like to put the suggestion out there that we stop using the word atmosphere and start calling it either the atmo plane or the atmo level. Remember that time in recent history when the television news reported that Trump was laughed at at the UN General Assembly? I would have expected more decorum from the people who the mainstream narrative says are in charge of a lot of things. Regardless of whether or not Donald Trump is a popular president, and you get different opinions about his popularity when you ask different individual members of diverse groups, he is the president of my neighbor to the south, the USA, and as a Canadian who respects the Americans I've met in my life, I want to always, in every year of my life, respect whatever individual holds the office of president, regardless of reason otherwise. And I want to live a very long life. I want to go to bed in peace every night knowing that the people in charge of things in the world are trying their best and behaving with decorum towards each other.
ought to be in picture. Uh, that's the best? It's another one to print. I think that's awfully good. That one and the one before it was pretty good. This we is have really... about 15 seconds? Oh yeah, you've got a lot of time. Yeah. I claim this land in the name of... What do you got now? Now move. Cut it, Jim. There you go. Print that. Yeah, Print for He needs to still pop uh, this mark. Uh, uh, one some more, please. Otherwise, he, uh, you know, the right, Let me walk it before you tell me. I don't want to. In the middle of it. You know, right? Here's what we really need is for him to go to his left and then kind of veer back. Is that right? Hatch light. Exactly right, and it has to be. Uh, we have to be high enough so that we've got blue. We've got you against blue sky and not against earth as you're coming in. You're coming in in a descending approach as you get in. Over. We can rehearse it. Said, go back and we'll rehearse it and see how it looks. Ready and action. Hands right. Lay down the mic. Use the second marker then. Love you, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, this is a hell of a time not to. That's right. We're yeah. in a little deep now, right. Bella, let me tell you. Uh -huh. We're rolling. Right now, Jim, that was better. Forget it. Wait a minute. Sorry. The third seat. Okay. Cut the third seat. Another one to print. I think that's awfully good. Let me use clamp sticks on this one. Be a right. mic tap hit. say anything about the, uh, you know, about the, uh, uh, just, I, I like to keep this stuff to an absolute minimum. Peter has... Head slate. You want to head slate? Head slate. Okay, you can be the biplane coming overhead about 300 feet. Okay. Cut the Tail side coming up right now. Uh, right now, Jim, that was better. Rehearsal, guys. All right, this is just rehearsal. Ready and action. Altitude to go high. I think it's been almost 10 years since we've been trying to do this. <laughs> Pitch forward, got a really good view of the You're looking side. great. Coming up nine minutes. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Peter has Peter has put a mark back there where he wants it to land. What, so what's you it look like? Five and a half oh, down. Right. It? It's a tire and something. Forward. forward. <laughs> Is it a good spot? Good to know? There. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. 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 Man on the moon. Okay. Ready and action. Uh, 
Uh, what do you think? Well, it's not a good idea, but... <laughs> what were you going to do? Right now, and that was better. Forget it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This is this shot, right? Only then, what are you going to move around another master before you get in closer? Oh no, this is this is this sequence right here. Now I'm moving yes. the two shot of you that picks it up from there, and then moving into a four shot that comes back from there. Uh -huh. It's as the scene progresses, we're going around the stage. Yeah. Uh, because I don't think you can divorce this conversation from that. I don't think it just came from the five solid minutes of this. Mm -hmm. Very important to understand that. You're reacting the way we would react to seeing this. Yeah. Have you had a good thing?